Hey everyone, welcome back to the Pace Studio. Right now we are live from the Manhattan Center with a very special guest, Ezra Furman. Hi. Hi. Thank you for being here. It's my pleasure. Paste really loves Ezra's new record, Transangelic Exodus, which came out in February. Mm -hmm. So tell us about the first song you're going to play. Well, it's a song from that very record. Uh, it is an ambiguous song. It's called Come Here, Get Away From Me, which is um, sums up how I feel about a lot of uh, strangers. That's how I feel about strangers essentially, and being in the um, business of trying to play my music in front of strangers, um, it, gets, it gets complicated. Uh, and also, this is the way that I wrote the song pretty much originally, and on the record it changed very much. So I'm kind of excited to show the old version of it, what it looks like naked without clothes on. Come here, get away from me. I suck all the life out of everything I see. I drink a bottle of wine, I got the digital content blues. I got money saved up somewhere. I lost a card in the checkbook, the name of the bank. There's a plague in my head, come here and get away from me. I believe in God, but I don't believe we're getting out of this one. Before somebody pays for the things I've done Did some terrible things, it's true But even terribler were the things I didn't do When I was living out in Kalamazoo Get away from me All my life, all my life I'm jumping rock to rock I'll see you in your dreams All my life, all my life Stayed up all night in the backseat parked in a field in Arkansas While a man on a motorcycle circles around real slow And you shiver and it's cold and the sun comes up And your friend wakes up and you tell him about the man Was he ever even there and you don't even know So you say, do you want to get to know me? So you say, do you want to make contact? Well talk to me baby, come here Talk to me, baby, come here Get away from me, talk to me, baby Get to know me, you can take a ride back I got one doctor that I talk to every week About this panic I got one doctor that I talk to every week About the apathy I can't wake up and I don't know how to sleep Honey, I got a paradox and I can't get free Come here, put your hand on my knee And don't touch me, get away from me All my life, all my life I'm jumping rock to rock I'll see you in your dreams All my life, all my life I built this fortress on me Head to your town, come here and get away from me Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so we mentioned your new record, which came out in February. Mm. Um, really great, vivid record with a lot of imagery about driving and Los Angeles and angels. And mm. there's queer identity in there and religion and a lot of complicated things. Um, I am wondering, like, to me, it's a very, like, L.A. record. Like, I think about driving when I, when I listen to it. So how did that city kind of inspire this queer outlaw saga, as you've called it, like this story that you created for it? It's a good question, because I've never lived in Los Angeles. Um, I have driven there a lot, and I live in, I currently live in Berkeley, California, and I got 
some friends in Los Angeles, you know, in the in showbiz, there's always something to go do in Los Angeles. So I've driven down to LA many times, um, and it is it has the, it has this thing, LA. Um, it has the air of fallen angels. It's a city of angels. It's a city of like um, enormous glamour and sort of American dreamness and and also just like busted living, you know? Um, homeless people galore and uh, failed dreams uh, and fallen angels. So it sort of crops up in a few songs on the record. Um, I mean, I and then I also just was rather obsessed with angels, and I created this angel character on the album, um, and this idea of people turning into angels and and being uh, stigmatized for it and threatened by uh, some kind of authoritarian government, which, you know, it's all rather conceptual, but it's uh, the story is not on the record, and you don't need to know the story you just get little scenes that's all you need um so I, I will play you one of the songs that is about um my angel companion who I go on this exodus with and it's also uh as you say about uh religion and spirituality it is called God Lifts Up the Lowly, um, which I think even if you've heard that kind of idea before, it's one of the most central things to uh, the, uh, the, the good kind of religion that, that I love, and it's easily forgotten. Um, it's easily forgotten that in the Old Testament, God's on the side of poor people uh, and people who are in trouble or being chased. Um, anyway, here it goes then. Fire and lies. I wake 
with my coat for a blanket. My angel's been up for an hour, and I've looked deep into this frail human body, and I know that I carry a power. to mention that you have a 33 and a third book out, right? That's right. It on, just came out. On Lou Reed's Transformer, which mm-hmm. is super cool. It's amazing that you had time to write that book in between releasing records and touring and doing all the mm-hmm. things that you do. Mm-hmm. But uh, w- when did you first discover that record and how did it shape you? Whoa. Well, it's, it's weird because I was obsessed with the Velvet Underground in high school and... Uh, and I never, I never cared to really look into any Lou Reed solo stuff. And then in college, I had a, I had a job at the music library where I went to school at Tufts University. And, uh, you know, they had a million records in there. And uh, I, my real, my strong memory, I just knew the song Vicious for a while. I mean, I guess I had heard Walk on the Wild Side somewhere, but I just knew Vicious, and uh, I kind of came down with the panic disorder of a kind in uh, college, and one of my first panic attacks, I was flipping out, didn't know what to do, but I was alone in the music library, and I put on Vicious at full volume and kind of just thrashed around until it passed. Um... (laughs) That's what came to mind when you asked me that. Uh, it, uh, I, I would like to say about the book that like I don't really worship the album Transformer. It's not the best thing that Lou Reed has done, I think. Uh, I just find it kind of fascinating. I find that point in Lou Reed's life and career very fascinating. He is on the... He's like this, this, the genius that never made it at that point. And then he was like, I'm going to do a pop record and I'm going to make it. I'm going to do whatever it, I'm going to like, it's, it's kind of a sellout, you know? Um, and he kind of uh, tones down or erases what made the Velvet Underground so powerful. But it also like shines through in this uh, very conflicted way. And it's kind of all the contradictions of Lou Reed come together in that. And it's supposed to be like this glam rock or like like a gay album of some kind. And and it's like kind of homophobic at times. And it's like his, his conflict just runs so deep and is so exposed in those songs, even when he doesn't want it to be. He's trying to just make it fun, but he... But the... That's the turmoil, the bisexual turmoil shines through. Um, Maybe you can sense some resonances this has with my own career and work. So that's where the obsession comes from. Did you find anything new or really surprising about Lou Reed or his career as you were doing the research for this book? Yeah, a few things. 
the, I mean, there's this great story about about him quitting the Velvet Underground, um, which I had never heard before, which is that he was like, this band has betrayed itself and I'm sick of it. And they were like trying, and their last album, they were like trying for, to you know, to get a bunch of radio hits and stuff. Um, and before the album came out, he was like, I can't do this anymore. This is this is not the band I, I started or wanted to be in. And he decided to quit, but he didn't tell his band that he was going to quit. And he came to the last show they ever played, having decided he was going to quit, but he didn't tell the band. And then they played this great show, and it's on tape. It's on that album, Live at Maxis, Kansas City. And then... He, after the show, he's like, the band's over. And then his parents came to the club and picked him up and drove him back to their house. <laughs> and he moved back in with his parents that night. And it's just like, I just love it. I love it. It's so, it's such a, um, <laughs> it's such a defiant way to, to fail. <laughs> to, it's just so full on. It's so Lou Reed and embarrassing, but fully like willful and defiant I like that stuff yeah he's like this mythical figure now but he kind of at one point was just uh you know playing basements and stuff like everyone else does mm, yeah <laughs> frustrated and insecure about money and personality um so I relate <laughs> yeah so uh tell us about the next song that you're gonna play Sure. Uh, this one has three chords. A lot of uh, a lot of times, somebody will tell you their song has three chords, and it's got a fourth chord. It's not only three chords. Everybody throws in a fourth chord, but this one really has just three. And uh, it was. Uh, I, I'm proud of it because it's actually one that has a that tells a story which is a hard thing to do, three chords and a story, it sounds like the simplest kind of song. For me, it's harder than, um, it's hard to be simple. Um, I think it turned out good, and it's called uh, Love You So Bad. One of my few, well, I guess I've written a few more love songs now, but it's not usually my, my go-to space, but it is... It's a love song about failure, screwing it all up, so. You know I love you so bad, I don't believe in love. You know I love you so bad, so bad. So bad, like the kid at the back of the classroom who can't do the math because he can't see the blackboard. So bad, you know, I love you so bad, like the kids skipping class in the bathrooms, sneaking cigarettes underneath the football bleachers, baby. So bad. Baby, so bad I still remember so bad The nights mom got drunker than dad did She told me never hang out with the bad kids Well, what can you say to that? I always knew I was bad Always dreaming, so they called me the spaceman You first kissed me in your parents' blue basement Wanted you, baby, so bad Attendant, but sober nights in your car were transcendent. I loved you, baby, so bad. You know I love you so bad. Somehow you got yourself accepted to college. You said that I could be a way out of all this garbage, small town rat trap. You moved away, that was that. You still sent me the occasional email. I got a dumb job working in retail. Yeah, baby. 
children grow up, the parents still remembers what they were like when they were little. That's, I see my songs kind of like little children of mine. And this one changed utterly. <laughs> but I like to look at the picture of what it used to be like. Um, and it's called Compulsive Liar. And it's about myself and the instinct to lie. It's actually about a lot of the same stuff that the Lou Reed book is about. The sort of growing up closeted and how it makes you shifty. Uh, it can make you into a person who, whose knee-jerk reaction is to hide yourself, erase yourself. And it's sort of the problem, that, that problem, uh, which... I have, chronically. I've got one fatal flaw. I'm a compulsive liar. If I don't Thank you. 
it. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Oh, thanks. Congratulations on your book. Thank you. Super exciting. Oh, I'm proud of it. Yeah. Um, and the album is Transangelic Exodus. We love it here at Paste. Everyone listen to it. Thank you so much for being here, Ezra Furman. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Au revoir.